Welcome everybody to another episode of our Exploring the Bible Together series. Glad to have you with us. I am Deacon Andrew Moore, and I am joined by Pastor Paul Miller. I'm Deacon Chris St. Clair. Glad to have you with us, Deacon Chris. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. We're continuing our, our look at this idea of the royal priesthood and the way that theme white weaves throughout scripture. Uh, we started with uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, and then Abraham and Melchizedek, and then Moses and Aaron. And what we're doing is we're seeing that even though a lot of these people weren't necessarily designated formally as priests, they, they filled a priestly role. And we're going to have that again today with David. We don't think about David as a priest. We think about David as uh, either a little shepherd boy, or we think about David as a king. Uh, so we're going to watch another video here and, and look at how, in some ways, David steps into and carries that motif forward, but ultimately still continues to point uh, to Christ. So let's watch the video. The story of the Bible begins in a place where heaven and earth are united as one, the Garden of Eden. And in that place, God installs his image. Adam and Eve, who will be God's royal priests and rule all creation on God's behalf. And this whole scenario is called God's blessing. But they're led astray by a deceptive creature, and they're exiled from the heaven on earth place and lose their job as royal priests. And humanity spirals down into violence. But God promises that a future descendant will come and defeat that deceiver by striking his head while also giving up his life so that all the world can experience the blessing of Eden again. This promise is passed on to Abraham and his family, from whom this royal priest will come. And this family grows and becomes a large people. And so God invites all of Abraham's family to become a kingdom of priests. God will come and live among them in the tabernacle, and that's where Israel's priests will do their work. But that priesthood gets off to a horrible start. Yeah, and so when Israel eventually becomes a nation, their priesthood has become really corrupt. And so the people start asking for a king. And eventually, God raises up David. King David. And he's full of trust in Israel's God. In fact, with God's help, he defeats Israel's most powerful enemy. All without proper weapons and without an army. Now, not long after becoming king, David goes up into the high hills at the center of Israel's tribes and he establishes a capital city, Jerusalem, otherwise known as Zion or the city of David. And it's like a new Eden. This is the same hilltop Abraham visited. It's where he met Melchizedek. And it's where God provided a substitute sacrifice for Abraham's failures. Exactly. And so David brings the tabernacle up into the city so he can make this the place of God's royal presence. And during the inauguration, David's dancing with excitement. Not only that, he deliberately dresses like Israel's high priest. And once the tabernacle arrives, he offers a sacrifice and makes this huge feast for all of the people and he blesses them. King David is acting like a new kind of priest. Yes, and God approves. In fact, in the next story, God promises that from David's line will come a king who will reign forever and build the ultimate new Eden, a temple for God's presence. David talks about this descendant to come in a poem we call Psalm 110. Yeah, David recalls God's promise that one of his descendants will rule at God's right hand. And he goes on to say that this future king will be a priest like Melchizedek. Yeah, Melchizedek, he's a priest king that even Abraham honored. Melchizedek's priesthood is older than Israel's priesthood. Exactly. But why can't David be that royal priest? Well, David was pretty amazing sometimes, but he also failed. He slept with the wife of one of his soldiers, and then in order to hide the whole affair, he had that man killed. That's horrible. It is. And his failures actually continued, leading up to this key moment where Israel's enemies were threatening to attack. And sadly, David doesn't trust God to deliver him like he did in his early days. Right, he counts all of his soldiers. He's trusting his own power instead of trusting God. And so God's not happy. He brings severe consequences on Israel. And David responds by surrendering to God and by offering his life as a substitute sacrifice on behalf of the people. That's like Moses who offered himself for the sins of the people. And it's like Isaac, who was offered up for Abraham's sins, but then God provided a substitute. 
I see. So there is a pattern here. Right. And it's this pattern that leads us to the story of Jesus. He claimed to be the promised royal priest that the story is pointing to, the one who will bring the blessings of Eden and restore humans to their lost calling to fulfill God's promises to Abraham and David. And it's his story that we will look at next. All right, welcome back. Uh, we're well into this series now, uh, getting a, a, a sense for this theme of royal priest. Um, and it's, it's a little bit heady, um, uh, trying to, to trace this. I think a couple of themes, I, I, I love when we take a step back and we see scripture as, you know, a bigger story. And then you notice some things. Uh, there, there are hints at least that um, other things have happened on this, this mountain that now becomes Jerusalem where David builds the temple. Perhaps this is where, um, uh, very, very uh, strongly implied, this is where Abraham and, and Melchizedek have met, um, but perhaps also the place where Abraham um, goes for that, that near sacrifice of Isaac. Um, now it becomes the temple under David. Um, I think I think my I find helpful that they're they're drawing out um, as we go through Abraham, Moses, now David, is is seeing how um, how these are very incomplete. You know, this is almost um, you know maybe there's a sense of improvisation or a sense of of partially filling these roles uh, in ways that that. Um, keep this uh, um, movement alive and this covenant people alive and connected to God, but, but clearly flawed and incomplete at the same time. I think that comes out strongly uh, with David. Um, but also um, this role of priest uh, is not limited to, you know, the hereditary line of priests, the ones who get the, the robes and who do this every day as their job. God's using other people uh, in a priestly role. And that points back to what I think is, is, you know, one of the more important themes of this series, that all humanity was called to be the priests in God's garden temple, which is creation. All of Israel was called to be a, a royal priest, a priestly people, um, mediating God's presence in some sense for the whole world, uh, and then anticipating that call to us all. So, um, so having surprising people show up in a priestly role helps us maybe think, oh, Maybe I need to think about that role differently. And how could a whole people be called to priestly service? How about you, Deacon Chris? What are your thoughts watching the video? Um, yeah, I, I to kind of piggyback off of uh, what Pastor Paul was saying, I think, yeah, uh, I, I noticed a, a lot of the ways that the different leaders, you know, when they talked about, you know, Adam and Eve and then went to, to Moses and Abraham and Melchizedek and how each of them fulfilled a, a, a role, but, but only a part of a role. And then sort of as they point, and they're probably foreshadowing to an extent, I would imagine maybe the, the next video or one of these later videos of Jesus as that fulfillment of those, those roles. Um, and, uh, and just sort of what that looks like. I, um, so I am kind of naturally drawn to visual, like whenever I see it. And that's partly why I love the Bible Project videos, because they give me something to look at and to think about. And the couple of things that I kind of noticed were um, like the graphic when it was talking about it, when it first got to like the story of Adam and Eve and, and all that stuff. And it's, it's a circle. And I kept thinking about, uh, you know, that, that sense scripture keeps kind of tying in all throughout scriptures, that sense of wholeness. And where that circle is consistently kind of broken and comes apart and then is kind of restored and comes apart. Um, and it's a subtle little thing that they do there, but sort of where that kind of weaves through the thread. Um, and, um, and one of the things that I always kind of, because like in youth ministry, um, you know, one of the common, I'd say one of the more common questions um, is tied to one of the scriptures that Jesus talks about that be perfect. Um, you know, a uh, uh, text. And, and so one of the things to point out is like, really, that, that word doesn't mean perfect as in I never make a mistake, you know, I get straight, straight hundreds on everything. But really, that sense of wholeness of that complete circle. Um, so I, I was drawn to that visual, I was also drawn to 
um, the visual of the mountaintop and what it kept talking about the, um, the role of the priest as sort of the mediator. I kept thinking about, uh, so I work at a church that's on Bat Cave Road, but we're right down the road from Natural Bridge Caverns. And uh, one thing I always think about with caverns is those stalactites and the stalagmites and when they kind of grow together. And so I just kept thinking about the, that role of the priest as the mountaintop and sort of that, those, those places in the world where um, it seems like the distance between heaven and earth is, is much smaller. Um, and so just that, that, and where all these mountaintop experiences come, Mount Sinai, um, you know, the, the Jerusalem on top of the, on top of the hill, the, you know, the Sermon on the Mount to an extent, um, but just those, so I was drawn a lot to the visuals um, of that stuff, but that, those were some of the things I noticed. I was struck this time with um, seeing that, that again, pattern of sacrifice and surrender. Um, that, uh, you know, we've, we've seen the role of the priest now really um, having to, to step out of a place of power and privilege because maybe that becomes God for them rather than God, um, in a sense, not trusting God, trusting in themselves, um, becoming too enamored with their status, their role, their title, being humbled <laughs> like David was. Um, and then you get, you know, you get Psalm 51, right? You get repentance, you get humility, you get surrender, you get, you know, thy will, not my will be done. And God continues to work through those broken vessels, if you will. Um, but that through this offer of surrender and sacrifice that God is actually able to, um, bring in restoration and healing but it's like we have to get out of our own way in order for that to happen. Um, so I, I, that was something that really has started to echo for me watching this series is how some, you know, so many of these characters had to get out of their own way eventually and just surrender themselves to God and say, your will, not my will be done. And maybe that's one of the functions of the priest is to just model that behavior for all of us. That, that we can also take upon that same idea of surrendering our lives to God. Yeah, that's a, you know, a common biblical idea of sacrifice, but one that either we just don't understand or have, you know, I've heard kind of strange ideas about or just wonder, but that, 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 that just basic giving, giving up, surrendering, um, and finally offering oneself to God's purposes, I suppose, would be all ways to get at that. Uh, I'm just noticing that you have the Temple Mount behind you there, Deacon Andrew. So we've got a visual. And from what I understand, the land all around Jerusalem is, is leading up to that, whatever direction you come from. Um, in reflecting on the royal priesthood, I, you know, in some sense, we're also reflecting on where are these points of connection? Um, where are these points where, you know, Eden having been... Um, become off limits that that way of, of just knowing God and, and uh, uh, having it be that simple um, uh, that being a thing at least for, for now a thing of the past and, and perhaps a thing of the future um, but in the meantime we need these points of connection with God and, and I see this um, kind of discussion that happens throughout scripture uh, again of maybe kind of a stopgap measure where God finds ways through through people uh, through places like mountains, like Mount Sinai, like the Mount of the Transfiguration and so on, that maybe um, is sort of a natural place of encounter um, or a place where people are aware more, uh, of uh, God's presence. And then these very intentional places. We've had now the tabernacle for a while that traveled with the people. And now we settle in Jerusalem with a place, the temple, to which people gather. Um, and and then, you know, again, all the, the advantages and the drawbacks of having a holy place. You know, is that where God is? Well, no, God's not limited. I think last time I mentioned the scripture in several places calls the temple the place where God's name dwells. God needed a place for the, the holy name of God to dwell. Um, God isn't limited by the walls of a, a temple. Um, 
And, and so, you know, to what extent is that great to have that place where we're aware of God's presence, um, where we can gather, where we have a place of holy encounter? Um, and to what extent is that a problem that then we are not discerning, you know, wherever we are in this garden temple, which is God's creation, um, in our homes, in our workplaces, in the really places we don't even want to be, and yet God's present. Um, uh, to what extent is it helpful to have that place? And to what extent might that trip us up? Something we've all been asking during, uh, certainly during pandemic times, uh, during those times when we were away from our churches and, and, and from familiar patterns. Yeah. yeah, I think we noticed at, at our church that people, um, yeah, they missed that, that place of encounter. I think like you pointed out for a lot of people, it's the church. Um, and I remember, I, I wish I could tell you what book it is and be able to quote the person. I think it was um, uh, one of Andy Root's books, but he talked about how the church has changed from a building space standpoint and how it used to be thought of as this space that is both occupied by heaven and earth. And so, you know, it is a holy space. And so, you know, it was all ornate and everything to kind of give up taste of what heaven would be like and how to some extent um they have just become buildings um and we've sort of lost that sense of magicalness a little bit um but i think during the pandemic i think for a lot of people we noticed that it still is there you know a lot of people find encounter in the buildings um but also in other places and i think um so when i when i first watched the video I, um, I started thinking about a beach um, and, and mostly because I think for me, you know, it, it, the beach is so relaxing, but I started thinking about maybe it's, maybe there's something magical about it where, you know, uh, as a metaphor where land and water meet and sort of that, that space where they overlap um, a little bit. And then I started thinking about where are these other places like for me personally that, um, I feel like heaven and earth overlap a little bit mm -hmm. for me. Um, and like, I thought, I thought, think about, uh, the church that I grew up in, um, up in North Texas in Garland area. Um, and, um, and where that, you know, for me, that was a, a place that I encountered God a lot through other people. Um, I worked in a, a summer camp outside of, uh, about an hour South of Indianapolis, um, and that, that place, it was right on the edge of a national forest and it became a place of, of encounter, you know, where those two things overlapped a lot for me. Um, and then I, I mean, we hear, and it's a common thing. I think a lot of people talk about that nature, that sense of nature where these things overlap. Um, I think we take kids to camp all the time. Uh, we take them to Chrysalis and Ebert through cross trails and for a lot of the kids, this becomes one of those places that mm -hmm. um, it overlaps a little bit. Um, so I, I'm curious, I don't know, can I ask a question? Sure. Okay, so um, so I've listed a couple places that for me that I think about is these, these places, at least how they've described, you know, the temple in Jerusalem, you know, the, 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 these mountains. Um, what are those places that you two think about? Because we all have different, you know, we come from different places, but mm -hmm. wh where do you encounter those things? Well, I think anywhere, as you say, anywhere you've encountered God's presence in the past becomes a place where you, you return and it, it, it retains that, you know, in some sense. Um, I think, yeah, you talk about uh, nature. I mean, I... I think the mountain imagery actually really works for me. Uh, mountains are a place of kind of retreat. And, and um, you mentioned that the land and the sea coming together, but also at the beach, you're so aware of the sky. And, and that, you know, I think with the mountains. Um, so lots of natural places. Um, also, though, I think um, uh, I think places where... Um, you're outside your comfort zone for me have been places of encounter with God because I mean there is there's an awareness it's not that God isn't pre present other places but sometimes you're aware especially if you feel like it's something God got you into 
<laughs> uh, then um, uh, then uh, you're 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 more aware. So it might be you know among people you know that I'm not familiar with or abroad or um, uh, among you know people in, in need when you're um, you know kind of thrown it whenever you've kind of thrown in the deep end that's where I encounter God most consistently um, so those are a few for me yeah I think the first time in my life I really just had that deep sense of um, intimate connection with God was when I was in high school um, I guess in junior high school I went to camp so that was certainly one of those places uh, Camp Luther Rock in North Carolina um, that was certainly one of those places, again, nature, you know, beauty, the stillness, the peace, God's creation. But when I was in high school, I went um, on a weekend retreat that was called Chrysalis, um, ironically, um, not Camp Chrysalis, just Chrysalis. Um, but it was modeled after Via de Cristo and Curcio and Emmaus and those programs where you have a weekend intensive and going through that as a young person. Um, and ever since then, for me, that that feeling, that that connection to God's presence, more and more, is about an activity and not a place for me. Um, some of the holiest moments I have had have been in some pretty unholy places. <laughs> um, you know, places you would not think to look for God, um, and yet in the midst of some of those activities, like doing service projects in places that uh, are not terribly, you know, what you would think of as, you know, some beautiful space or whatever, but you're encountering people in the rawness and the reality of their life. And then to watch a group of young people be the hands and feet of Christ, to me, that's seeing the kingdom of God. So I've, I've really learned to just cherish those opportunities for those activities um, both for myself and, and wanting to have that sense of, of uh, fellowship with other people, but also communion with God, but also then to give them a taste of that. Uh, because what I have found is when you, when you go to camp, kids get a taste of it and they, they develop a, a, a hunger for that. And they, and they want to deepen that experience when they do service projects and they find that they really, really were touched by uh, whatever the project was you know, but, but encountering people that they normally wouldn't have encountered and moved outside their comfort zone. And all of a sudden seeing God's there too. Mm -hmm. um, not just inside the walls of a beautiful sanctuary and kind of deconstructing that idea. It's ironic because David wanted to build a temple and God said, no. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was more like, okay, David, just be, don't, don't do just be and be the priestly role for the people. Don't worry about this, the building so much. So, yeah. Well, and as someone who ends up being, a, you know, a, a, a something of a, a spiritual guide, I suppose, when, when we have those experiences, the key is how do you take it with you? You know, uh, the, you know, um, going to Jerusalem, what, three times a year from many of uh, the folks in, in David's time, how do you take that? with you how do you you know and whatever experiences we've had or, or the folks we're with um how do how do you take that uh experience and and understand that god's with you and uh, as you you know it's like coming down the mountain from the transfiguration right jesus and the disciples saying okay here's what you saw but now here's what we're going to go and see on the way to jerusalem and there's that contrast uh, yeah yeah and uh yeah, that, that image that we often forget about, you know, you, uh, even the priests don't always stay in the Holy of Holies. You know, they kind of go in and, and they have to come back out. And, um, you know, everybody comes up the mountain. Moses goes up the mountain, but then comes back down. And, and uh, yeah, oftentimes it's the, I want to stay here forever. I want to feel this forever. And it's, and it's, that's where that, um, I think part of the role of, of sort of um, being in ministry both is like, I mean, we're, we're paid professionals for this, but I think as just as being a child of God, being a disciple of, of Jesus, that it's, it's that uh, being with people um, mm -hmm. when they're, you know, in those places, you know, those where they are directly encountering God, but also walking with people when they're 
apart from that or or they feel far away from that right um and how we how we carry those things and and i think all throughout scripture that you know that like the video kind of ties back together so much of their longing for jesus was wanting to to get a taste back of what they experienced with david what they experienced with moses what they experienced with you know adam and eve and all those little tastes is sort of this this leading towards this person of jesus um they want to go back to that they want to have that that priest that you know priest of all priests well great we uh we could probably just keep going and talking about all these amazing places and experiences and the ways that we encounter God. We'll, we'll wrap it up for today here. We'll pick up the next video, um, which looks at, again, the series that, that Jesus then becomes a priest for us in a way that really just transcends everything that we've seen, everything that people have ever experienced before that. Um, so how about you close with, close with a prayer? Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the ways that you move through our lives, the ways that we have a sense of connection to you. Uh, we also pray in those times that we have struggled with that sense of nearness, uh, that, you would, that you would touch us and remind us that you're always with us. Uh, we give you thanks for your servant, David. Uh, and uh, despite his flaws and failures, the ways that he continually turned back to you, surrendered himself to you, and modeled how, uh, how to just let go and, and turn our lives over to you. So help us uh, let go of things that we may be clinging to too tightly, uh, and remember that, that um, like David, uh, that you don't forsake us. Uh, that you stay with us, uh, that you are a God of, of healing, that you are a God of forgiveness, you are a God of love, uh, and that even though we have places where we designate regular gatherings as a faith community, that really it's the whole, it's the whole world around us that is your temple. And so all of us are called to be those priests. And so uh, we pray for courage to do that, to live, live as your faithful people, uh, and to share that love with others as we encounter them and do all of that in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, Deacon Chris, thank you so much for being with us today. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. And we'll see everybody next time on our next uh, episode of Exploring the Bible Together. So until then, take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.